Good morning, uh, respected chairpersons, uh, all the dignitaries and uh, physicians, clinicians in, present in this hall. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Siddesh and the ISHBT and IMA Nashik for inviting me for this talk and Siddesh has kept me as the opening batsman today. So, <laughs> uh, I will try to do justice to uh, his... Uh, so as we know, often we get referrals from our colleagues in medicine, pediatrics, and all other specialties for thrombocytopenia. And often that thrombocytopenia can have a wide range. Some, sometimes we get referrals for platelet count of 1.2 lakhs because the books say that uh, normal platelet count is 1.5 lakhs and above. So we can get platelet uh, referrals for uh, platelet of 1.3 or 1.2 lakhs, sometimes borderline like 80, 90,000 uh, for surgery clearance or uh, for procedures like angioplasty and all those things. And sometimes we do get referrals for severe thrombocytopenias like 10, 20,000 with or without bleeding, which signifies some, something sinister. So we must always remember the basics. Am I audible? We must always remember the basics. Everything, like if, if something is decreased in the body, these mechanisms will cover all the conditions which cause. Like decreased production. Bone marrow is not producing platelets. It can be any bone marrow failure, aplastic anemia, myelot uh, aplastic anemia, inherited bone marrow failure syndromes in children and young patients, acute leukemias, marrow infiltrative disorders, like myelofibrosis, myelophthysis. So anything which produces, it causes decreased production of platelets in the, from the marrow, okay. Next is ineffective production. What do we mean by ineffective production? The marrow is trying to produce more and more platelets, but ultimately less number of platelets are being produced, normal platelets are being produced. So this is ineffective production, okay. What are the causes of ineffective platelet production in the marrow? Myelodysplastic syndrome and megaloblastic anemia. Megaloblastic anemia due to nutritional B12 or folate deficiency is very common. Okay, so ineffective production of platelets in the marrow, as in megaloblastic anemia and myelodysplastic syndrome. Next is increased destruction of platelets. Body is producing more platelets, but they are getting destroyed. Where can these be get, uh, getting destroyed? Either in the spleen like in immune thrombocytopenia, ITP, or in any reticular endothelial system, or in the liver, spleen, lymph nodes, uh, as in hemophagocytosis or HLH, okay? So this is, can be, this is mainly immune-mediated destruction of platelets. ITP, as we know, is one of the commonest causes of thrombocytopenia. So increased destruction of platelets. Next is increased platelet consumption. This is important. This is non-immune non-immune mediated, so it is not destruction, it is consumption, like if there is severe bleeding, if there is DIC, like in obstetric emergencies, obstetric complications, there is disseminated intravascular coagulation, platelets are getting consumed, like in thrombotic microangiopathies, platelets are getting consumed, okay? And then sequestration, where sequestration in the spleen, if the spleen is enlarged, like in portal hypertension, chronic liver disease, platelets are getting pulled. Normally our body, one third of our platelets are always residing in the spleen. And if after, if it is required, it comes to a circulation. So in hypersplenism or splenomegaly, there is increased sequestration, increased number of platelets are sequestered in the spleen. And as we know in medicine, often there are multiple causes. In the same patient, there can be two or three different mechanisms occurring at the same time leading to thrombocytopenia. So this, uh, possibly this is the most important slide of my talk today. If we remember these five mechanisms and that they can often interplay and remain in combination, then we can usually pinpoint the diagnosis or uh, make a differential diagnosis list, okay? So what are the common causes of thrombocytopenia? We see in our daily practice. It, 
somewhat varies in the pediatric and adult population, but more or less these are the most common causes. ITP or immune thrombocytopenia. Previously, it was called immune auto immune thrombocytopenic purpura. Okay, so immune thrombocytopenia most commonly idiopathic or primary, and the secondary causes are hepatitis C infection, HIV infection, SLE, neo hematological neoplasms like CLL, non-Hodgkin lymphomas, etc. Then the neoplasms of marrow like acute leukemias, chronic leukemias, lymphomas, myelodysplastic syndrome, myeloproliferative neoplasms like myelofibrosis in advanced stage of myelofibrosis, okay. Aplastic anemia and in children and young patients, we must remember the inherited bone marrow failure syndromes like Fanconi anemia, etc. Drug-induced thrombocytopenia is possibly very, very common, but often patients are on multiple drugs, so it is very difficult to pinpoint on any particular drug. Antibiotics like penicillin, cephalosporins, rifampicin, vancomycin, these are common drugs. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is a different entity, which I will not be discussing here, because that is associated with high risk, very high risk of thrombosis, and often seen in hospitalized patients. We hardly see in OPD patients. I'll be focusing mainly on OPD, OPD patients. Liver disease, either chronic liver disease or acute liver disease, is one of the most common causes of thrombocytopenia because liver produces thrombopoietin, and which is essential for platelet production. Also, liver failure is often associated with hypersplenism, like chronic liver disease, hypersplenism, that can cause sequestration of platelets. And as I mentioned, portal hypertension without liver disease, like extra hepatic portal hypertension can cause hypersplenism. Okay. So these are some of the common causes. There are other causes also, but more or less this we should remember. In children, sometimes we see rare diseases like Viscot Aldrich or um, like the hereditary inherited macrothrombocytopenias, which however are rare. What is the first step if we get a patient in the OPD who has been referred or patient has himself or herself come to us that my platelets are low, 70,000, 80,000, and it varies from lab to lab. So the first step is to rule out pseudothrombocytopenia. What are the causes of pseudothrombocytopenia? That means the platelet counts are actually normal or near normal, but they are not counted accurately by the cell counter. So either it can be EDTA-induced pseudothrombocytopenia, because some of us have antibodies which are activated by EDTA anticoagulant, and as soon as our blood is mixed in EDTA, it causes clumping of platelets. The cell counter does not count platelets accurately. So it gives a low platelet count. Okay. So EDTA-induced pseudothrombocytopenia is one of the causes of pseudothrombocytopenia. Other causes are giant platelets. Normally, many individuals have borderline platelet count, 90,000, 1 lakh, but the platelets are big. There are some polymorphisms which are responsible for that, but these are normal, not, these are not pathological. Okay, so giant platelets or macrothrombocytopenia. So how should we approach to rule out pseudothrombocytopenia? We must repeat the platelet count by a good cell counter, automated cell counter for which the lab runs, controls daily, and the reports are validated, okay. Next, we should check the platelet histogram on the CBC printout. It will show us, tell us whether there are large platelets and there are, actually the platelets are normal in number. Next, we should check the peripheral blood smear, which is very important to look for giant platelets, we can, or platelet clumps. We can reassure the patient that, the person, that you are normal. You have platelet clumps, that is why the cell counter is giving or the platelet counts are falsely given as low. Platelet morphology is important, like bernard sulia syndrome or some inherited platelet function abnormalities can have large platelets with granule abnormalities. Okay. And often the peripheral blood smear will examination will reveal the diagnosis of the cause of low platelets, acute leukemia, acute promyelostatic leukemia, CLL. Okay. Then we can repeat the platelet count with some other anticoagulant like sodium citrate instead of EDTA. And finally, we can also double check 
with a direct finger prick smear, which often gives the platelet count as normal. We can ask, tell the patient, okay, or the physician that your platelet patient has normal platelet count. You can go ahead with your angioplasty or whatever surgery you are planning. Okay. These are some other helpful platelet indices which the lab can give us if they have a good uh, cell counter, like the mean platelet volume. The mean platelet volume is big, is increased if the platelets are bigger in size or volume. Okay. Then the platelet distribution width, PLCR, that means platelet to large cell ratio. If PLC, the PLCR will tell us how many platelets, what percentage of platelets are more than 12 femtoliter in size or volume. Okay. And this is a relatively new uh, parameter, the immature platelet fra fraction, which is often helpful in diagnosis of or suspecting ITP. Now, what is the approach to diagnosis in a patient who presents to OPD with thrombocytopenia? As I said, complete blood count, which will tell us whether there is isolated thrombocytopenia or other lineages are involved. If it is isolated thrombocytopenia, we can think of causes like ITP, uh, first of all pseudothrombocytopenia, then ITP, then some uh, rare con conditions like amegakaryocytic thrombocytopenia, all those things. If other lineages are involved, like th there is anemia, there is leukopenia, neutropenia, then we think of bone marrow disorders like acute leukemias, bone marrow infiltrative disorders, bone marrow failures like aplastic anemia, IBMFS, and also portal hypertension like conditions. Then, what about the marrow? If at all we do a marrow, bone marrow is not needed in all cases. It is hardly uh, necessary maybe in 20 or 30 percent cases where you are suspecting some marrow disorder. So there, we have to see whether it is megakaryocytic thrombocytopenia. That means in the blood there is thrombocytopenia, in the marrow the megakaryocytes, the precursors of platelets are either normal or increase in number. Or it is amegakaryocytic thrombocytopenia. That means the bone marrow megakaryocytes are decreased in number. Okay. This will lead to the etiology. And the status of the rest of the bone marrow erythroid series, granulocytic series, lymphoid series, plasma, plasma cells, all those things. Okay. So this is very important. Peripheral blood and then if at all we do a marrow, then marrow. How to approach a detailed history? I am not going to the details because I, I have kept some case studies, interesting case studies, which will be better. So detailed history, physical examination, look for spleen size, any active bleeding, retino, uh, retinal examination is important because if someone has low platelet count and their retinal bleeds, you are very, you should be very cautious and you should manage aggressively because retinal bleed can herald uh, re an intracranial bleed. Okay. And often the other findings like gum hypertrophy or leukemic infiltrates in the skin, a big spleen, all this can lead to the diagnosis, it hint to the diagnosis. Then lab investigations. What lab investigations? We cannot overstress on examination of the peripheral blood smear and the CBC. Okay. So complete blood count by a good cell counter, good automated cell counter validated by the pathologist. Platelet count and the indices if possible, if available. Reticulocyte count is important because if you are suspecting bone marrow failures or immune uh, conditions like Ivan syndrome, ITP, retic is important. Peripheral blood smear examination, often these two will give you a diagnosis in more than 90% cases. A coagulation profile is important if you are suspecting there is some coagulopathy or DIC like hepatic coagulopathy, coagulopathy of liver failure, liver disease or if you are suspecting DIC, this is important. Viral markers, as I have said, secondary ITP often is associated with hepatitis C infection, okay. And again, chronic liver disease due to hepatitis C can cause hypersplenism. Liver function test, kidney function test. LDH is important. Sometimes it is helpful in conditions like TTP, okay. Serum B12, folate, ferritin, iron, these are important because often 
many patients will have coexistent nutritional deficiency and sometimes this nutritional deficiency alone alone can be sufficient to cause thrombocytopenia like very low b12 word folate if you are suspecting some portal hypertension then you should do go for or liver disease you should go for ultrasound and splenoportal doppler okay so these every, all of these investigations are available everywhere you don't necessarily need the plated indices okay but the plated count must be cross checked on the peripheral smear and if necessary citrated non edta sample i'll briefly discuss on itp because it is an important diagnosis for us and often it's not straightforward itp is a diagnosis of exclusion so if someone comes with a plated count of 50000 whatever investigation you do you can hardly say that okay this patient has itp unless say after down the line after one month two month the patient presents with bleeding and the platelets now have dropped to say 10000 or 20000 now you know okay she, that patient had itp now it is time to treat okay so itp is not that straightforward um, as we know it's autoimmune platelet destruction mediated by antiplatelet antibodies usually it is isolated thrombocytopenia remember there will not be leukopenia there will be not be disproportionate anemia if you if the anemia is not correlating with the amount of blood loss think of other conditions okay platelet can be normal uh, mild thrombocytopenia moderate severe very severe okay but severe bleeding or major bleeding is less common in itp compared to other conditions like acute leukemia then the differential count will be normal for age we must remember that children often have lymphocytes more lymphocytes than neutrophils so that doesn't mean it is abnormal anemia should be proportionate to blood loss no abnormal cells in peripheral blood smear that is the most important thing peripheral blood smear should be absolutely normal and in primary itp usually there is no organomegaly or lymphadenopathy no if you do a marrow nowadays bone marrow is not Uh, done that frequently in itp if it is straight forward in elderly or in young children if you are suspecting something else you do marrow it will show mega karyocytic thrombocytopenia and then your job is to do work up of the secondary itp conditions like hepatitis c hiv sle and other autoimmune autoimmune disorders uh, connective tissue disorders then lymphoma cll and drug induced as i said drug induced itp is or drug induced thrombocytopenia is difficult to diagnose because often there are multiple drugs but if you know the drugs which cause thrombocytopenia commonly you can stop that drug and see whether platelets are recovering so essentially itp is a diagnosis of exclusion not all patients require treatment and if treatment is required you can safely go ahead if you are confident with your diagnosis now we'll go for some case studies uh this will be i hope this will be interesting and we i will cover all the conditions which i have mentioned 25 year old lady acute onset of bleeding around 2 to 3 weeks and mid cycle menstrual bleeding okay before the next date of uh, the cycle the lady has started menstrual bleeding there is some spontaneous skin ecchymosis otherwise asymptomatic no other symptoms absolutely stable this mild pallor often ladies menstruating females have anemia because of iron deficiency so mild pallor no major bleeding who grade 1 say the lady has come with a platelet count of 10000 from outside hemoglobin tlc dlc were normal you have cross checked the results are more or less same in your lab also and the per peripheral blood smear is not showing any abnormal cells so what is the diagnosis what could be the common diagnosis provided you have ruled out zero thrombocytopenia this lady has bleeding so possibly the platelets are actually low so this is the first case most probably the diagnosis is itp or immune thrombocytopenia so we must differentiate between primary or idiopathic and secondary work up of secondary itp is negative you have done viral markers negative we don't necessarily need to do ana if there are no symptoms of sle or chronic uh, connective tissue disorder so what will be the first line treatment 
if the as platelets are 10,000, she has bleeding, so treatment is indicated. The first line treatment is either prednisolone or high dose dexamethasone. High dose dexamethasone up to three cycles if there is response, and prednisolone at least three to four weeks at full dose. If there is no response and there is still bleeding, then you go for second line therapy like you add rituximab to the steroids or you straightway go for rituximab or the thrombopoietic um, like um, l thrombopag or romiplostim if the patient is not willing for uh, rituximab. Okay. Again, this is a pediatric, I mean child, five-year-old girl, acute onset of skin bleeds, minor epistaxis, otherwise playful, stable, recent history of a viral fever. Child is stable, this is very important. Child is stable, there is no pallor. Liver, spleen, lymph nodes are not palpable. CBC is showing platelet count of 5,000. Hemoglobin TLC, DLC is normal for age. And you have ensured that the peripheral blood smear has been very carefully, very carefully seen to look for any blasts. This is most important in this patient. So what is the diagnosis? Most probably it is ITP. If you are confident that peripheral blood is not showing any blasts. So then what will you do? Again, it's usually primary ITP in this age group. Bone marrow, whether to go for bone marrow or not, if you have even 1% doubt, go for a marrow, okay? Because you don't want to lose time treating like ITP and it turns out to be acute leukemia. So if you have 1% doubt that it could be something else other than ITP, you go for marrow. What else can you do? You can try IVIG. If there is a therapeutic response to IVIG, then it is ITP for all practical purposes. If there is no response, go for a marrow. So what will be the treatment? In children, usually IVIG is helpful because the dose is low, uh, dose is not very high and often it can be given. IVIG and a short course of steroids, two to three weeks. Two weeks of steroids followed by taper over one week. You don't give prolonged steroids to children. And if there is a response, that means plated counts increasing more than 30,000, it's enough, okay? You just reassure the parents that it's, uh, it can recur in 20 to 30% cases, but it's not life-threatening. Okay, third case, a 65-year-old lady, again, acute onset of bleeding, otherwise asymptomatic, stable, no organomegalo lymphadenopathy. The blood counts, complete blood counts are showing mild anemia, hemoglobin of nine. The TLC is increased, total leukocyte count is increased and it is lymphocytosis, uh, lymphocytic leukocytosis. The lymphocytes are 75%. Peripheral blood smear is showing mature looking lymphoid cells, not immature or blast like cells. And there are smudge cells also. Plated count is very low. You have done, because the retic is high, see, the retic is uh, increased, 8% for a hemoglobin of 9 gram per DL. The retic index is high. So, a direct Coombs test was done and it came out to be positive. So, what could be the diagnosis? Peripheral blood flow cytometry for a chronic leukemia panel. And it turns out to be CLL. Okay. So then what is the etiology of platelet, uh, low platelet count in CLL? One, it can be bone marrow failure, decreased production, or it can be increased destruction. So this is one of the indications of doing a marrow at CLL diagnosis, if there is unexplained cytopenias. So here, the marrow is showing increase in lymphoid cells as you see in CLL patients. Megakaryocytes are increased in number with both mature and immature forms. There is no dysplasia. So your diagnosis is possibly in this patient of CLL, the patient is having autoimmune thrombocytopenia and autoimmune hemolytic anemia, which is called Ivan syndrome. Okay, so this is, as I said, CLL in one cause of secondary ITP. It can be either ITP or Ivan's. So how do you treat this lady? Do you think treatment is indicated for CLL chemotherapies? Usually, if it's not indicated initially, you start prednisolone corticosteroids for adequate dose and duration. If there is response, then you continue, followed by taper. If there is no response, then you treat with rituximab. And sometimes if there is no response in platelet count, like platelets are more, 
10,000 or 20,000, 30,000 patient is bleeding, then you consider treating like with CLL regimen, like bendamacin, rituximab or the others. Okay. Now, fourth patient, uh, young girl with acute onset of bleeding. Same, similar presentation. This girl has fever, history of fever for around a month. Okay, and fatigue. So there are other symptoms. Child looks febrile in the OPD, uh, looks sick, there is fever, there is significant pallor and bleeds, cutaneous bleeds. You get sp mild splenomegaly, generalized lymphadenopathy and the CBC is showing high CBC is showing high leukocyte count. Peripheral blood is showing 60% blood, blast with no odds. So, what is the diagnosis? Don't say ALL, it's acute leukemia. ALL will be proven by flow cytometry only, na? So, you see that the morphology is like this, okay? And then, what is the next step? Do you do a marrow in this patient? You have to do a marrow ultimately, but you can diagnose within 24 hours if from peripheral blood only. You go for immunophenotyping by flow cytometry. Peripheral blood has enough blast, so you, for an early diagnosis, you go for peripheral blood flow cytometry. It is showing B cell acute lymphocytic leukemia in this patient. So next one, then you do the bone marrow cytogenetics for, reason, for prognostication and you start treatment with pediatric ALA regimen. What is important in this patient? Till now we have not transfused platelets to our patients, but this child needs platelet transfusion because in acute leukemia, unless you transfuse platelets when the patient comes to you with very low platelet count, the patient can develop a life-threatening intracranial or other bleed, okay? So this was a bone marrow failure due to acute leukemia. Case five, a young lady, presenting with bleeding from multiple sites, a very short history of around seven days. And there is possible retinal hemorrhage also, okay? The lady looks sick in the OPD, you immediately send the patient to emergency for stabilization. Why I am coming to it later? Because there is bleeding from multiple sites. What could be present in this patient? Other than thrombocytopenic bleed, what could be present? See, there is a report of DIC profile which is suggestive of derangement of coagulation profile like DIC. CBC is showing anemia, WBC count is normal, platelet count is very low and the peripheral blood smear is showing hypergranular promyelocytes. This is, we are very much afraid of this condition, okay, which is, it could be either hypergranular or hypogranular variety of variant of acute promyelocytic leukemia. Previously, it was a very, it was associated with very high mortality. Now, possibly this is the most curative of, curable of all leukemias. If you treat aggressively, almost 100% survival in this once deadly disease. So what is the diagnosis? Acute promyelocytic leukemia with DIC, you must remember. So how do you manage? You have to literally bathe the patient in blood products. Platelets, no amount of platelets is sufficient for this patient initially. You give six units, eight units, ten units, or if you have SDP, you give SDP. You have to give fresh frozen plasma and cryoprecipitates also, okay, because for DIC. And immediately you have to start differentiating therapy with all trans retinoic acid and arsenic trioxide as a life saving measure. Subsequently, you send fish or PCR for PML data to confirm, you don't stop therapy, and if it is confirmed, diagnosis of APL is confirmed, you go for the treatment, standard treatment. Uh, uh, sorry, sir. Yeah. Another three minutes. Okay. Uh, sir, but uh, before that, sir, since most of us are practicing other fields of medicine, and in the times of COVID and H1N1 and dengue, we would like you to give us a quick flow chart on management of patients uh, of fever with progressive thrombocytopenia. Okay, I'll with the emphasis I'll just on dengue, discuss. probably. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, I'll just briefly discuss. Okay, because, madam, uh, see, my topic was mainly in OPD, so I'm concentrating in the OPD patients. I will definitely discuss in. Uh, 
So again, another patient, 60-year-old male with features of bone marrow failure along with pancytopenia, no blasts. What should you do? What are the DD? Aplastic anemia, MDS, acute leukemia. You must always do bone marrow and send flow cytometry sample because you don't want to get a report after three days that it is acute leukemia or even acute promyelocytic leukemia and lose valuable time. So you should send cytogenetics and flow cytometry at the same procedure. Okay, and tell the pathologist, tell the lab that if there are blasts in the bone marrow, please process the sample. Okay, here there are no blasts, no dysplasia, cellularity is very low for age, cytogenetics and fish for MDS normal, so diagnosis is severe aplastic anemia, treatment is standard treatment at this age for, with immunosuppressive therapy and here also if the patient has bleeding, you must transfuse platelets whenever the patient comes to you. Similar uh, age and presentation, but here the same diagnostic workup has been done. Here the marrow is showing features of myelodysplastic syndrome, okay? So you have done cytogenetics for risk stratification and prognostication. You treat with MDS-like therapy. Supportive treatment, platelet transfusions, if indicated, must not be denied to the patient. A patient comes from gastro OPD. Known case of chronic liver disease, they have sent to you for platelet count of say 30,000, 40,000, no bleeding. But you do CBC, the WBC is also borderline, okay? And differential count normal. See, the differential count is showing neutrophilic predominance, okay? That is normal. So possibly it's hyperspirism related to chronic liver disease and portal hypertension. If you feel that marrow is indicated, you do a marrow, but may not be, may not be necessary to avoid uh, pain to the patient. The marrow will be essentially normal. But you must also do workup for the anemia. And the patient has iron and folate deficiency. So what is the final diagnosis? In a case of chronic liver disease with portal hypertension and hypersplenism, there is also nutritional deficiency, anemia of iron and folate. So you treat in the line of uh, re replacement and follow up with the gastroenterologist for the CLE and portal hypertension. So I have tried to just uh, discuss some common cases. I don't want to prolong the uh, cases. To address Madam's uh, query, if uh, someone presents to us uh, or the medicine or pediatrics OPD with fever and low platelet count, history is important. If the patient is still febrile, the, it is looking like a viral illness. We have to rule out some common viral infections which are associated with thrombocytopenia like dengue or now COVID. Uh, and so also recent vaccination is important. History of COVID vaccine or some other vaccine, MMR in children. Okay, these are important. Then we must again rule out pseudothrombocytopenia. Okay, actually the platelets are low or normal borderline. If the platelets are actually low, then we must think whether it's immune-mediated thrombocytopenia or it is just a thrombocytopenia, transient thrombocytopenia associated with the viral infection. If there are no alarm signs, then we can treat with our uh, medicine colleague or pediatrics colleague, you could treat in the line of the viral infection. If there are any danger signs or alarm signs as I have discussed, then we should, and peripheral blood smear should be normal, madam. Okay, often children with leukemia or adults with leukemia can present with fever because of uh, low WBC count and infections. So the peripheral blood smear will tell us, repeated peripheral blood smear examination may be essential. And if any indication is there towards a plastic anemia or some other bad diseases, then we should go for the in bone marrow. Bone marrow can give you a diagnosis in hours, okay? In the same, you do the marrow in the morning, you send to the lab, you stain, it takes hardly one to two hours. And the person, lab person sees and tells you, okay, there is nothing on the aspirate at least. So in 80, 90% cases, the aspirate can tell you, okay, there is nothing bad. If the aspirate is diluted, you, go for, you rely on the imprints. Imprints are very important, biopsy imprints. If aspirate and biopsy imprints, both are not showing any abnormality. Then you wait for the biopsy report, treat with supportive treatment. If platelet counts are very low, 
like 10,000, 20,000, less than the critical, below the critical limit. And if you feel that patient needs platelet transfusion, obviously platelets must be transfused. If you feel it could be ITP, you give IVIG. A trial of IVIG, platelet goes up, then it was immune thrombocytopenia. Okay. So thank you. Uh, I hope I have not exceeded my time. And <laughs>